Okay, well, our next uh, speaker is uh, Raisa D'Souza. She is uh, a professor at UC Davis in uh, both computer science and uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering. And by training, she's a PhD in statistical physics. Uh, she is an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, she's been a Kavli Fellow uh, at the National Academy of Sciences and in other ways has been recognized as uh, you know, kind of a rising uh, star. Uh, she has papers that uh, are very much uh, mathematical and engineering, looked at issues like uh, network failure. Uh, so an example of paper is uh, suppressing cascades of load in internet dependent networks, which would be, uh, for instance, well, you know, the electricity system uh, uh, cuts down. Uh, so she really is, uh, and then on top of that, she's doing, uh, particularly recently, a lot of social science uh, related research and we're about to find out about that research. Thank you. Thank you, and what a great conference. And uh, it's really exciting to see this new Institute for Social Sciences and a lot of my collaborators from across the colleges here at UC Davis in the audience. And we just had a statistics symposium about two weeks ago as well about networks and big data. So there's certainly a, a real interest in coming together across the disciplines. So it's a really exciting time here. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some mathematical models that we use to study influence and opinion dynamics in social networks. So I guess the question is, what drives social change? Wouldn't we all like to know that? And as I was preparing for this talk, it's not really my main area. I do more of applied math and statistical physics, but I'm really very interested in social systems. So I was trying to think of what I should speak to in this audience. And what was really a wonderful coincidence is that Bloomberg published this data just last week. And they were looking at the accelerating pace of social change. So it was looking at several key issues in society, like interracial marriage, um, prohibition, women's suffrage, and the um, vertical axis, which isn't labeled, is the number of states that have passed legislation in favor of this thing. And the horizontal axis is how many years it took for that to happen. So you can see things like um, interracial marriage took about 19 years before it was approved in about half of the states. Um, prohibition took 13 years, women's suffrage 10 years, same-sex marriage two years. So we're really seeing that uh, social change is happening and at a much quicker pace. Um, and here's some examples of different kinds of social networks. So on the left-hand side is a picture from Mark Newman. And here the nodes in the network are individual people. And the edges represent some kind of relationship with, between them. And we're interested in things like epidemic spreading, epidemiology, immunology, viral marketing. On the right-hand side is another social network. Here the nodes are countries, and the edges represent some relationship between those political nations. And we're interested in economics and politics and stability, et cetera. Um, and increasingly, the systems that we're interested in are socio-technical systems. So they're technological networks that are fundamentally connected to the social networks that drive them. So two examples that um, I like to think about a lot is open source software. We have a large collaboration here um, with um, several people in computer science and sociology thinking about open source software systems. So open source has all this data available for us to explore. And we're really interested in things like how the social interactions uh, via email and bulletin board postings of people lead to higher quality code that they write. So we've got a, many layers of networks, the interaction amongst the individual people. We have the interaction amongst the code. These are either function calls or inheritance relationships. And then we have the bipartite mapping of the people to the code that they commit. And then in critical infrastructure, we're also seeing increasingly so that it's getting more and more socio-technical. So two of the examples I think about a lot are things like power grids, where it's really the human in the loop. If you go to the uh, people, the operators of the power grid, like Cal, ISO, and Folsom, there's a big operating room where there's about 20 people sitting, looking at computer screens, making real-time decisions and interventions to try and prevent failures. So the human has to make a decision and change a lever. 
And there, even though we've moved a lot towards automated controls, the human decision making is still a fundamental part of the loop. And also in things like financial markets. Of course, we're seeing auto, more and more automated trading where algorithms are making decisions, but it's still really the people who are also interacting. So instead of how do we model social change, I thought an easier question would be how do we model collective phenomena in networks? And that certainly ties in more with my background of statistical physics. So one of the first simplest ideas of collective phenomena and networks that we study uh, is an idea that comes from random graphs. So we're gonna think about having a collection of say N nodes that are isolated. And then with, I'm gonna examine every possible edge that could exist between any two nodes. And I'll add that with probability P. And with probability one minus P, I don't add that. And I wanna know what does a typical graph look like parameterized by that probability P. And this is where I see um, a very interesting change. On the left-hand side, um, the probability P is quite small. Uh, and I colored in red the largest connected component, the largest group of nodes that can reach each other along a path of edges. And here on the right-hand side, you can see the probability is still quite small. It's double, but it's still pretty tiny. But that largest component starts spanning the space. We can also map this onto a contact process. So I can think about infecting an individual and understanding how many other individuals is it possible that it could infect. And we see this thing called a phase transition or the emergence of a giant component. So as a function of that parameter P, when I'm uh, on the subcritical side, the largest component ends up being logarithmic in the number of nodes. I cross over into the supercritical regime, and as soon as I do, the largest component is linear in the number of nodes. So I see the emergence of large-scale connectivity. And we can actually map out the dynamics that uh, would produce this type of behavior. So this is a classic example of an emergent phenomena in a network, that we see this type of phase transition. So the example that I gave you here is called percolation, and it's a smooth transition, and it's um, a, a useful model if we're thinking about a contact process on a network, or we're thinking about epidemic spreading that infected people come into contact with susceptible ones and infect them with some probability P. We also see much more interesting kinds of collective phenomena and phase transitions, and that's what's, oh, sorry, and that's what's uh, oops, shown here on the right-hand side, um, which is often called a cusp bifurcation or a cusp catastrophe. And this is the equation that describes it. And what we're thinking about is having two possible equilibrium. So um, this parameter A is going to change very slowly. And we're going to start on the, the lower branch. And the, the parameter A starts slowly changing. And as soon as it reaches this breaking point, I jump up to this other equilibrium. And this has been used as a model very often when there are two stable possibilities. So it's the simplest example I like to think about is the transition from vinyl records, LP records, to digital music. So A, the slow moving parameter, would be our access to the digital world. So at this point, almost everybody has internet connectivity who um, lives in a big city. So A would be basically your access to internet connectivity, the expense of putting digital music online, et cetera. So once we reached that point that it was no longer sustainable to make LP records, everybody switched from this stable equilibrium immediately jumping to that stable equilibrium. So that's a much more abrupt shift. So those are two kinds of phase transitions that we often see in network systems. Um, Manipulating phase transitions is one of the main areas that I study. So one of the things that we have been analyzing is how repeated small interventions can really change the nature of the phase transition. So in this context of having a large component, if I wanna delay and delay and delay the onset of that giant component, I get this red line instead of the black line. So I can delay and delay and delay and effectively uh, prevent large-scale connectivity, but I can only prevent it for so long. And then once it finally does emerge, it happens in a very abrupt and explosive manner. So that's really a big focus of my work. So now I'm going to go out on a limb and talk to you about things I don't know so well. And so I'm not a sociologist, but there's been a lot of great work in the last 10 years of doing mathematical modeling on networks to try and get some insights into human behaviors. So these phase transitions are one of the main things that we'd like to study. How do people adopt new products? How do diseases spread to um, end up being pandemics? And even these phase transitions depend quite sensitively on many different things. So for instance, they depend quite a bit on the network structure, on that underlying network. So what is the degree distribution, or in other words, the variation in connectivity? 
Are all the nodes connected in the same number of other nodes, or do we have some nodes that are high degree hubs and some nodes that are leaves? Um, is the network very modular? Oops, I did it again. Is the network very modular? So does it break up into pieces very effectively? And that's gonna affect the phase transition. But more importantly, we also have to figure out what is the mathematical model that we're gonna be using to model complex human behaviors. And um, the simplest idea is this idea of epidemic spreading or a contact process that I have an infection, I come into contact with someone with probability P, I pass the infection on. But even that has some challenges that I'll show you. And one of the open questions there is, how do people change their minds? Do they need to have a critical mass of others or is it a diminishing returns? And in that case, who is more important, influential nodes or susceptible nodes? These are open questions. And then we also have some very simple models that are a little bit beyond the contact process, so thinking about voter models and opinion dynamics of consensus, and there we see the role of zealots plays a very important role. And then finally, things I won't talk about today, but hopefully our keynote speaker will be talking about strategic interactions on network systems, which is in increasingly um, becoming part of the study in the physics world as well. And one of the questions we always like to ask is, is there a Nash equilibrium? So is there some way that every agent can act on their own and make themselves as happy as they can possibly be. And if so, that leads us to decentralized solutions. So we're getting these massive networks, they're growing in size. It would be very nice if we can let things happen in a more local, decentralized manner. So um, our simplest ideas for human behavior is to think about binary opinions. So you can have one of two opinions, minus one or plus one. So you might be healthy or infected. Uh, you might hold opinion A or opinion B. You might adopt a new product or you might stick with the status quo. Many other choices. So here the question is, what causes an opinion to change? So the first um, model that we might consider, or first question we might ask, is how, what would make an individual change their mind? So these figures here, even though this, they look a little bit like those phase transitions I was showing you, they're looking at the individual person. The phase transition was thinking about the collective behavior of the system. So now we want to ask if I zoom at, into the individual level of a node, what would make that node flip their opinion from minus one to plus one or vice versa? And there's two different schools of thoughts on this. And the first one is that it's diminishing returns. So this is my number of friends and that's the probability that I'm gonna change my mind. And so if we have a diminishing return scenario, it means that every friend influences me a little bit more uh, it influences me, but each subsequent friend has slightly less influence. So the first person's most influential, the next person exerts a little bit more influence, third person exerts more influence, but it's diminished each time. Or do I need a critical mass? And this is more like the phase transition that I was showing you. Once a critical number or critical fraction of my friends adopt the new behavior, I'm gonna change my mind. And they have very different properties. And there's a big debate about what's the way that people actually work. And Dean Eccles was here a few months ago from Facebook, and he was talking about A-B testing, and he started out his talk showing diminishing returns versus critical mass. And I thought, oh my God, I'm finally gonna get the answer, but he didn't uh, address that question because they, they couldn't answer it either. So we really don't know what makes people change their minds. And of course, these are very big simplifications. If things do act by diminishing returns, it's awfully nice because they're really well-behaved functions, and we can use greedy algorithms to try and find the influential nodes. So I find the node that's going to exert the most influence on the network, and then I can find the next most influential, et cetera, et cetera. So very efficient algorithms exist for finding influentials, and John Kleinberg and Yura Leskovich and David Kempe have been doing quite a bit of work in that area. On the other side of things, uh, it's more like this percolation picture that I showed you of the phase transition, where we use a lot of techniques from statistical physics and generating functions to try and predict how many people are gonna have adopted the behavior at the end of the day based on the underlying network structure. And there, the big debate and open question is what's more important, having susceptible individuals, so individuals whose thresholds are quite low, or having influential individuals who have many other neighbors and are gonna drive big scale change? And that's also an open question that we don't know the answer to. Um, with one of a uh, sabbatical visitor, Choi Heng Lai, um, we've been trying to tease out some of these uh, differences between susceptibles and influentials, and we, our mathematical models show that it really depends on the kind of influence. Is it a passive influence or is it an active influence? 
Um, so the second more complicated way that we might think about people changing their minds is something called the voter model, which has been studied for quite a long time. Um, Sood and Redner were the first to think of it on a network context before people were studying it on a lattice. And the voter model is basically thinking about individuals who have no opinions of their own. They ask a neighbor, what should I think? So it's the tell me what to think model. So we're gonna have some underlying network and at each time step, we're gonna pick, pick a node, and at random, pick a neighbor of that node, and the first node will import the opinion of that neighbor. So we pick a node at random, and that node asks its neighbor, tell me what to think, and it adopts that opinion. So if we have a network where we have a degree distribution of this kind, where we have a few nodes that are hubs, and most of the nodes are leaves, if we pick a node at random, we're gonna end up picking leaves with high probability. So if I pick a node at random, I'm always gonna be picking these little leaf node guys, and those leaf nodes are gonna be asking a partner of those, and with high probability, their partner is gonna be a hub. So we see flow from the high degree nodes that don't change their mind to the low degree nodes that change their mind frequently. And at the end of the day, once the dynamics settle down, there's ultimately only one opinion that prevails for the voter model, and it ends up being the highest degree hubs that win out. We can also think of a slightly more complicated idea, which is thinking about open-minded individuals. Instead of people who have no opinion, these are open-minded individuals, and this is called the naming game, and it has a long history, starting in 1995, studied on networks most re more recently. And it was originally thought of as a model for linguistic convergence, so coming up with consensus about what we're gonna name things. So we're gonna start out from the simplest model, which is that there are two possible opinions, A and B. And each individual can hold opinion A, they can hold opinion B, or they might hold both of them. And how this is gonna work, at the same, similar, at each time step, we're gonna choose a node at random, so maybe we'll choose this guy, and then it's gonna choose a neighbor at random and they will exchange opinions. And if they both agree that they have one of the opinions the same, they'll reach a consensus and adopt that same opinion. Uh, on the other hand, let's say that this had been my node I chose, and it chose this as its neighbors. He'd say, well, I think it's A, you think it's B, so I'm open-minded, I'm gonna add B to my, my uh, set of possibilities. And if we do this, um, we uh, end up with some very interesting results as well. Um, mostly about the impact of zealots. So zealots are committed individuals who never change their mind. So no matter what kind of evidence you can present to them, they will never change their mind. And I'm sure we know many people like that on several different issues. And these are the equations that would describe that naming game with zealots. So the X is the fraction who hold opinion A, B, Y hold opinion B, Z hold both opinions, and then we have some fraction P of, ze of zealots of opinion A, fraction Q of zealots of opinion B. And one of the surprising things is if we include zealots in something like the voter model, the tell me what to think model, a finite number of zealots ends up dominating. So I just need one or two individuals who are zealots and they prevail independent of the size of the network. The naming game is a little bit more forgiving because instead of a number of zealots, we need a small fraction of zealots. So we need say 10% of our network. So in the voter model, one or two stubborn individuals sw completely sway the outcome. In the naming game, we need a small fraction of individuals and they completely sway the outcome. And um, so it, it, it's a, a pretty um, damning uh, idea to have these zealots because they end up having a total say over the outcomes. And very recently with Alex Wagen, who is a student here um, and just got his PhD, we extended this naming game model with zealots to think about having K opinions. So instead of A and B, you can have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or any combination thereof because you can hold all possible su um, subsets of opinions. So here we were thinking about the idea that the world isn't binary, it's not either A or B, there's usually multiple choices. So we might think about operating systems, are you gonna run Mac OS X, are you gonna run Windows, are you gonna run Linux, even within Linux there's multiple flavors, what kind of cell phone are you gonna buy, et cetera. So in the real world we're normally confronted with many choices and not just A and B. So um, once we, uh, do the analysis and add zealots in, we looked at two different types, two different situations. So if you have zealots of only one opinion, 
quickly that opinion is going to dominate and win out over all others. Even if you started with a network where everybody, uh, the majority of nodes held a different opinion, a few zealots end up swaying the whole outcome. And it's also uh, the other limit that we studied is if we had an equal fraction of zealots of all kinds, so if every opinion had a few people who adamantly believed in that opinion, we quickly reach a stalemate. And what this plot here is showing us is the place where you reach a stalemate as a function of the number of opinions. And so this is the number of opinions, and this is the fraction of your population that has to be a zealot for that opinion. And you can see that it rapidly goes down to zero. So the more and more opinions we have, the easier it is to have a fractioned population that's never going to reach consensus. So for some reason, this result that appeared in Physical Review E was exciting to several journalists. So they contacted us and started asking us questions about how our mathematical results could apply to the real world. And we said, we really don't know. Um, but then uh, they started talking to some political scientists and started a dialogue. And from our mathematical models, there were two conclusions that Kurt Hahn, the um, science writer who, for Inside Science who wrote this story, came up with. So um, our first result, if there's zealots of only one kind, that zealot's opinion dominates, independent of how many other opinions there are. So putting that in a more real world context, they were saying when there's a lack of committed customers for other products, you don't have to worry about any of your competitors. Just court the zealots of your product and make sure that they're gonna stay committed to you. And it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing, with, so put all of your energy into making sure your zealots are happy. On the other side of things, when you have so many different opinions and zealots supporting each one, you're gonna quickly reach a fractured, splintered um, situation. And so maybe there'll be a chance that you overthrow a ruling party, but once that ruling party is gone, you'll never have a consensus again. So you'll just have a splintered group of minorities. Um, and that was divided opposition may fail to create a stable future government. This has been observed many times in history. Um, and what I think about, for the most part, really is the interactions between all these different kinds of networks. So we have social networks, we have technological networks, socio-technical networks, biological networks, information and communication networks, and they all interact with each other. So if we think about something like a, bi a biological virus spreading, that biological virus mutates in the using gene and protein regulatory networks. It spreads over social contact networks, which are abetted by long links from airline networks that need information and communication technology networks to be operating properly. So we really try and think about what are the consequences on things like phase transitions once we start coupling together different kinds of systems. And this is um, one of the papers that Colin was mentioning on uh, suppressing cascades, where we were able to establish this notion that there could be optimal interdependence, that a little bit of interacting with others was actually beneficial, too much interactions with others ends up um, causing a lot of systemic risk. But um, one of the things that we've done very recently with George Barnett um, in the communications department sitting there in the audience is thinking about these cusp catastrophes when you see sudden changes from one equilibrium to another. So the example that I used earlier was thinking about going from the stable equilibrium of everybody buying vinyl LP records to the stable equilibrium of everybody getting digital music. And we wanted to think about this in the context of coupled networks. So we said, let's think about these cusp catastrophes but we're going to think about system X having a cusp catastrophe, and it's going to drive system Y, which can undergo a cusp catastrophe, which then drives system Z, which could undergo a cusp catastrophe. So in other words, let's say that um, the United States, what decisions that they make might have a lot of influence on France, which might have a lot of influence on colonial nations of France and Africa. So we were trying to think about a main system X that drives a system Y, that drives a system Z. And we found two different um, interesting ways that these systems could undergo their catastrophes. So the first one is synchronized or they topple like dominoes. So X falls, then Y falls, then Z falls. But we found this very other interesting phenomena that we call catastrophe hopping. So we see that X falls and undergoes its cusp catastrophe. And because it fell, it changes the parameters of system Y just a little bit. And that's enough to cause a system down the hill to topple. So we see that X topples, Y gets a little bit weaker and it causes Z to topple. And um, the intermediate system weakens enough 
but not enough to topple. And we find a regime where that happens. And then we were looking for some way of corroborating that this might be um, a mechanism that happens in real systems. And we turned to look at the Arab Spring data. And what this is showing on the horizontal axis is the date of first protesting breaking out in a nation. And the vertical axis is actually the unemployment rate, which is often thought of as a confounding factor that leads to protest. And what we found was that um, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia really acted as these intermediary systems. So we had uh, topplings of one nation protesting. There was a lot of communication exchange via the United Arab Emirates and um, Saudi Arabia to other countries who then toppled. So we see these motifs as evidence that this kind of catastrophe hopping could happen in real world systems. And of course, there's also some analogies to financial systems and banking. So we can think about bailing out a large bank, but it might have ripple effects that causes the two small banks on either side of it to have to topple. So, um, one of the other things that we've recently done is um, with Jessica Flack, who appeared a few times in the, um, the uh, macaque monkey descriptions, uh, we put together a um, special issue of the proceedings of IEEE. IEEE is the International Electrical Engineering Association, so it's the main society for electrical engineers. And as we know, the world is getting so much more interfaced across the disciplines. So the engineers are building all these platforms that is collecting the digital footprint and all this data about human behaviors and enabling different ways of studying it. So um, the proceedings of I the IEEE Society asked Jessica and I if we could come up with a good contribution, a good list of people to help us envision how the world is changing because of this new technology, yet also feed back to the engineers who are building this technology what people really want. So there'll be a two-way dialogue. And so um, we put together this proceedings that came out in December, the impact of changing technology on social networks and um, argued, we, we wrote a small essay to start with, um, sort of thinking about Jared Diamond's ideas and gun germs and steel, that in the, in the past, social networks were small, they were geographically isolated, power and influence were concentrated, and now we have this world with massive online experimentation, global information exchange, and the accelerating rate of, of, um, of opinion change, as I showed you in one of the very first slides on this paper. So I kind of wanted to just start a dialogue and let you know some of the things that people in my community are thinking about. Of course, these are not realistic models of human behavior in any way whatsoever, um, but they certainly give us a lot of possible patterns and mechanisms to be thinking about. So thanks.